And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen His glory. The glory is of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because He was before me. From His fullness we have received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made Him known. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. How does something spiritual become tangible? How does something we can't see or touch, touch us? How does that work? How does that happen? How does the Word become flesh? The Word here is a, a play on words that, that John uses because it takes a Hebrew thought and a Greek thought and puts them together. The word of God. We all understand that from the Old Testament. The Word of God. When God speaks, things happen. God spoke and the creation happened, right? Word of God. But, but in Greek, when it translates, it comes out logos. Logos or logo. Symbol. Something you look at and know what it means. Two completely different thoughts in one word that John uses in Scripture here. What in essence he's saying is, God becomes flesh. What's spiritual becomes tangible. And it happens in a mysterious way in Jesus Christ that, that we really still can't understand. We try to explain it as He is the God-man, all God, all human, all those different things we say. But let's just look at it a little differently today. Have you ever had a time, I know I have, when, when you prayed and it just seemed like nothing happened. You're not nodding. I'll keep on this subject until you nod. Here we go. You go this way or you can go this way. But you got to go one way or the other. All right. Now, I've had those times when, when I really, really, really was empty inside. When things weren't working. When, and, and I would pray and it's just like it hit a brick wall. And, and it, I stayed empty. And it was, it was hard. Those are some of the hardest times in our faith walk. And I don't really know what to say or do in those times. It, it, it's just so empty. There's a story that Kara Ox tells about a, a rabbi who has a disciple come up to him and he says, Rabbi, I'm suffering so. Why are you suffering? Because God's hiding from me. And, and, and the response is from the rabbi, at least you know he's hiding. Another rabbi walks up and says, What is this? At least you know he's hiding. Does that alleviate your disciples' suffering? He says, Absolutely not. It just gives it meaning. And I read that story and I went, Yes, I understand that. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to think God is hiding when God's presence is not real. For just a little while. I, I, I understand that because I've experienced it and, and that really helped me because I realized what I was saying. You see, I believe it's those times when we have the most faith. When you can't feel it. When there is no blessed assurance. When there's, there's no gushy feelings. When, when nothing's coming through. That's when we really have it. Faith, when there isn't a tangible expression of God's presence, and we say God's hiding, faith is when things are unseen. Hope comes, and we walk through those times. You know, I got a feeling there are a lot of people in this world that may not even know to pray and ask for God's presence. Who never felt God's presence. 
And then there are those who have and it's gone. And it doesn't feel that way. That must be, must be hard. The scripture moves on. The word became flesh, and, and the old translation said, and dwelt among us. And this one says, lived among us, lived with us. And in the original language, that word is not dwelt in, in the way we understand it. It actually literally means he pitched his tent with us. Isn't that a fascinating way of saying that? Remember, these are a bunch of ancient Bedouin types from their past. He pitched his tent with us. In other words, when God becomes flesh, he didn't, he didn't just walk around. He actually pitched his tent. He lived with us. He, he shared pot with us. Not that kind. You know, the kind of the fire. And, and he, he ate with us. Okay, it took you a while. Sorry, sorry. We're not in Colorado yet. Sorry. No. But, but, he, but he, he sat with us. He ate with us. He talked with us. He lived with us. He shared with us. God with us. Luke calls it Emmanuel, right? John says the word became flesh and pitched his tent with us. And I think about that and I go, wow, how important is that? Because how many times in, in, in my life when I've got that dry feeling inside spiritually, when things aren't happening, when, when the prayers bounce back, and I'm not feeling it the way I'd like to feel it. How many times have I gone to church? Or have I gone and seen someone that I know cares about me and loves the Lord? And through their touch, something happens. I went to see Ray Kirchmeyer. Ray's the, the guy back here that plays guitar. On, on sometimes he hadn't been here a while because he fell at work. And he hit his head from 12 feet up. It was a horrible accident. Uh, the good news is Ray was at least able to nod at me this week. It's awesome. It's awesome. But as I walked out of Ray's room and walking past the surgery waiting room at Parkland Hospital, and you can imagine, if you can't imagine, let me just tell you, it, it is a hard place to be at surgery waiting at Parkland. And, and the people there that are all kinds of shapes and sizes and ilks and everything else. And as I'm walking past the room, I look ahead and there's a lady on her cell phone and she's crying and she's trying to talk to a loved one I gathered. And as she's doing that, I realize what I've got to go do. I've got to stop and say, I'm a pastor, are you okay? Right? Come on. And as I get close to her, I'm about as far as me from Buddy. I get close. I see someone coming the other direction. It's closer. And I see a badge, name badge on. And she touches the lady's shoulder. And I realize as I get closer, she's a chap. And the lady turns and just goes, All it took was a touch on the arm and on the shoulder. Just a touch. You see, friends, I believe there are times in our lives when the Word has to become flesh. <coughs> because I need it, and I dare say, you need it. There are times in our lives when somebody has got to touch me. When somebody has to be there to let God's presence, God's Holy Spirit become flesh because that's so vital when I'm having a hard time. When you're having a hard time. We need God's touch. And Paul tells us that we are the body of Christ. We, through what God has done in us, through a mystery of His presence with us, has made us into the body of Christ. And when we walk out from this place, we carry Christ with us. 
And when we touch somebody, that includes you, not just preachers, by the way. It includes all of us. When we go out there and we touch somebody in the name of Jesus, they receive that gift. I did a sermon series a while, a long time ago on baptism, and, and I realized that something really wonderful happens when, when I baptize you. It's not just me. See, the hand that I baptize you with had a hand that was on my head. Can you imagine it? And that hand was Bishop McFerrin Stubb. He ordained me an elder. But, but there were hands on his head, you see, and those hand to head goes all the way back. You see, Coke's, Coke's, uh, Coke and Asbury came over from England, didn't they? They were our first bishops as United Methodist, Methodist at that time. You may not know that. Their name was Coke and Asbury. That's where we get the bookstore, Coke's Berry. And they had hands, a hand laid on their heads. And the hand that was laid on their heads before they laid hands on everybody who's ever preached in the United States. Was John Wesley's hand, and, and John Wesley was had the hand of a bishop on his head, and, and a, that bishop had the hand of the Archbishop of Canterbury on his head. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, if you go all the way back to the, when they were Catholic, had a cardinal's hand on his head, and the cardinal had the Pope's hand on his head. Are you catching on? And the Pope goes all the way back to Peter, and Peter was touched by who? Jesus. And I thought, isn't it amazing? Apostolic succession is what that's called. From the apostles all the way to us. Isn't it amazing that every single one of us can trace, if we got down to it, we could trace the touch, the real word made flesh all the way back to Jesus. But then I thought, this last week. It's not just baptism, is it? It's this too, isn't it? When the body of Christ is placed in our hand, the hand that touches your hand has been touched by hand, 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 and it goes all the way back to the Master who broke bread and gave it to His disciples. It is a real touch to touch all the way back to Jesus. Then the scripture adds one more part. And in him we receive grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. It's not just grace. Not just grace. It's not just for me. It's grace on grace. I get more grace than I need. And when I leave here, when you leave here, when we go out from this place, when we go into the world, when we touch someone else, we touch someone with the extra helping of grace that we've received. You touch someone. When, Sandy, when, when we put the, the food in the boxes on Friday and people pick it up on Saturday and they take it home, when they pull that that spaghetti or whatever it is or that can of food off the shelf, there will have been a hand that touched that can that they touched that goes all the way back to Jesus. When somebody comes to the diabetes support group and, and people pray that, that they be okay, there's a hand that goes back. When a child gets a shot, believe it or not, gets a shot, there's a hand that goes all clothing is put on racks. When, when someone comes into our Bible studies and we hand them a Bible, when third graders get their Bibles, the very hands that have touched your Bibles have gone all the way back to Jesus. But it's not enough for me to keep the touch to myself or you either. We are called on to keep passing that touch on. Grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. I did a funeral for a friend this week, uh, Teresa. She didn't ask that I come back and preach at it. 
we did amaze together a lot on TV. She asked that I drive to Tyler with Kathy and that I do communion for all those who gathered at her service. It was that important to her. So I did. And you know, we believe in the communion of saints. And so I was telling the people in, that, that Teresa was with us because the saints were with us in that moment. And all the saints were with us. And after the service, it was a really fascinating thing that, that pastor, her pastor said to me. He said, Jeff said, isn't it amazing how long our communion rail gets? It goes all the way to the beginning and all the way to the end of time. That's a pretty long rail, isn't it? And I like that. We're a part of thing that's so much bigger. So Jesus pitched his tent. God pitched his tent. As I look at this building and at what we've done, haven't we pitched our tent, the body of Christ? Haven't we said that here's a place where we are going to be a part of the community in which we live? Isn't it vital? We talked about this yesterday in the Ministry of Council Retreat. Would it make a difference in Grand Prairie if we weren't here? What do you think, church? Yes. I guess the positive way. Does it make a difference that we are here? Yes. Would the community notice if this was suddenly gone? Yes. Absolutely. Why? Is it because we're such wonderful people? No. It's because through us, God pitches His tent in Grand Prairie. And He puts His touch in Grand Prairie. And through us, He makes Himself known. I watched a really awesome uh, documentary this week about Billy Joel. Anybody know who Billy Joel? Some of you people are too young for Billy Joel. <laughs> And some of you might be too old for Billy Joel, but that's okay too. Uh, he was asked, I, didn't, I had forgotten this, he, he, he was asked to go to the Soviet Union in the 80s, late 80s, to do a rock and roll concert and do it all over Eastern Russia. Moscow, St. Petersburg, now this is the Uh And he did rock and roll, and it was fascinating to watch. As long as the police were in the room, all the young people sat there like this. The police left, they went nuts. <clears throat> Billy Joel, as the time went on, kept getting more and more into being with the Russian people. And as he, as he was there, he would get a wireless microphone and go out and dance and sing with them in the, in the audience. And, and, he, and he took his energy and his love of life and love of people out there and he brought his daughter and his wife with him and he, he said the one thing I want to be able to do is when my daughter asks me daddy what did you do to stop the cold war I want to be able to tell her I went to Russia and said wow and it was awesome to watch him connect and I remember as I watched this wonderful documentary my being in Moscow, and my being in St. Petersburg, and me sitting down with some old women at table and talking back and forth and realizing that they had as much Jesus as I've got. And that the hope for the United Methodist Church in Russia was that they were there. And I thought I was going to go give them a great bunch of stuff about worship, which I did. But I got so much back. Where I really received the blessing was when we had communion and a Russian pastor put the elements in my hands. And I realized the first thing I need is grace. I've got to receive this. And then grace upon grace for me to be able to get it. I remember standing in front of one of my Russian friends that I got to meet. 
and saying, Jesus Christ died for me. And he died for you too. And isn't that awesome? And then I realized there is no one in the world I can't say that to. We have received grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. And when I'm dry and empty and the prayers just aren't working, I know all I've got to do is count on you. And you'll bring me back. All I need is a touch. And I'll be okay. It's all I need. It's all we need. It's also all the world needs. Amen.